sure to engage with that and make sure to follow that we don't miss any of the action this weekend. You know, we have the Pioneer 10K today, but we also have a modern 5K tomorrow. That's going to work points for our leaderboard as well. And we're about to go ahead and down to the match here as it's starting as George versus Drew is beginning. And George, tried and true Dom, leads with a Halfhound tap and pass as, oh, a tap swamp from Drew. There, there are a few things that are but one of those is that George will have those Ascension Hallow Fountains in his egg one way or the other. If we ever do a standard tournament here, not sure how that's going to work, but we'll figure it out. It'll be fine. Yeah, as we do see a Blood Tide Harvester come down for Drew, and George responds with an Omen of the Sea. He's going to do a little scry tune, figure it out. I will give, uh, you know, George some props. George always plays control decks. He's been doing a lot of unique and innovative stuff when it comes to Pioneer. And his deck this weekend really shows that. We have... Uh, five different unique planeswalkers, including the new Kaya from All Will Be One. So George's deck has a lot of spice going on. So you're going to see some exciting stuff despite being a control deck because we do see an island and go for George. Three mana, nothing to do. Attack for three from Drew here. Yeah, I think generally consensus has it that uh, the Rados midrange deck is a bit of a tough matchup for these control decks, which is why you don't see as much of them as you used to. However, uh, George is a control expert who will have built his deck with matchups like this in mind. And also, you see their Yorion just chilling over there uh, on the side. The addition of that card comes with some trade-offs, uh, certainly, but this is one of those matchups where having this this eighth card, which in turn will draw you a bunch more cards, great way to go over to the top in these uh, mid-range subs. 100%. As we do see Drew here attack for three again after George played the land in the past. We're going to see a thought sees George is going to decide, does he want this happen? We'll hold up some mana. By the way, shout outs to George. You know, Dom, last time we covered him together, we called out his basics for being draft box, and he went out and got a bunch of beta basics. So I love to see it. George waited for feedback, always improving. We love that here. As Thoughtseize reveals the hand of commit memory, uh, saw it coming, Narset, part of the Veils, and the Wandering Emperor. Yeah, you see some signature cards uh, from George. A big fan of Narset. Set power of veils, and you see over there in the land base, uh, Dire Reach Sanitarium, a card that really pairs nicely with that, can in theory lock your opponent out of the game entirely uh, uh, if you can water them down to an empty hand and activate that during their draw set with set. And then also Commit Memory, where you can remove a permanent from play and then uh, after Master the memory side, pair that with Narset, and your opponent has uh, no hand and maybe no board anymore. <laughs> and we do see what I'm taking. Drew's like, all right, second thought sees. Would you like to let me go again? George is going to think a little bit. Looks like he might be. Uh, casting a saw coming doesn't want to have Drew take the second card. Interesting. Probably means George didn't matter that much about the uh, Wandering Emperor there being taken. Yeah, wow, Drew, uh, a true do, hero. Do, do you love the George power move as well? Uh, you, thought seizing George, letting him pick the cards up, and then immediately casting the second thought seize to, <laughs> to get them back mm -hmm. on the table again. Well, you gotta let Drew, you gotta let George know that you know you're also a control deck. You control the pace of picking the hand up and down. You know. So we are going to see George play Water Dave <laughs> yeah. and pass the turn. Yeah, up until now, this is a, a start from a just normal blue white Yorion deck, but the, the Watery Grave and some of these cards hint at something a little bit different going on. As we do see, oh, a memory deluge was to draw for George, and that's going to be huge. He's going to look at the top four and put the two cards he wants the most in his hand, and he took those pretty quickly. Dom got me thinking there might be a Teferi five in there. Yeah, he, he knows exactly what he wants in this situation. And Memory Deluge, one of the best cards printed in, in years and years for these control decks. And so if these control decks are good, often Memory Deluge is, is a big part of that. Yeah, we do see George Down 11 here just played Land Go. We do see Drew activate a Castle Lock Lane. I don't know how many cards Drew has in hand, but I think he took a little four ball there. Uh, you know, Castle Lock Lane lets you activate and draw a card, lose life for each card in your hand. It comes with a price, but, you know, against George, he doesn't really pressure that life hill too much. Although Wandering Emperor, if you need to get aggro and get busy, uh, that is the card that lets you do that. It's true. <laughs> yeah, George tries to get some loyalty to Owen of the Sea there, you know, hanging out. George is going to go back up to 10 after the Wandering Emperor does exile Blood Tide Harvester. Now Drew has no pressure. There's no creature lands to activate at the moment, just Castle Lockwane. And we see George sort of take some advantage of that with no land for turn, but just a tick up of the uh, Emperor. As yeah, Drew does take that, that Wandering rock. Emperor so 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 well disguised that the loyalty counters ended up on a completely different permanent uh, instead. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, who are they? Who knows? As Invoke Despair comes down, George Shabor does have the commit memory. He's gonna put that second from the top. That means it is coming back. 
Yeah, but there's, there's a lot more where that came from. Four copies of Invoke Despair in, in Drew's deck here. And so th that's a change which should stand him in very good stead in this matchup. And so uh, if George is able to establish uh, control this easily, well, I think we're reinforcing why uh, George's changes make this matchup uh, so good for him. 100%, yeah. And then Narset Partaville is coming down with a minus. It's going to grab Elf the Sun's champion. That's the card we sometimes Jeez. see in sideboards of these blue-white decks for this exact matchup. Georgia Boar, when you have 80 cards, you can have this in your main deck, and that is huge. You know, Invoke Despair is going to kill a Planeswalker, but we have George making a Samurai real quick, and yeah, we're going to make a bunch of soldiers. So George is going to be able to really actually clock. You know, we joked about how he can't kill very quickly. Well, Drew has no creatures, and George is about to have an army of 1-1s coming down. Wandering Emperor taking up, Samurai getting in for three, and then uh, we mentioned Drew can afford to take a four damage here, take a five life loss here. That's not really the case anymore. <laughs> that, 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 that script is about to change. Yeah, George grabbed the Supreme Verdict just in case somehow, you know, Drew spews out a bunch of creatures on board. George will be ready in the late game. As it does look like George is going to pick up Yorion, which, you know, he knows Invoke Despair is coming from Drew. As we're going to see Drew end of turn here, go for the throat down the Samurai token. Yeah, George playing a little offense and a little defense at the same time here. And yeah, I, Drew is separating those lands. I'm going to go for that Invoke Despair one again. Yeah, here it comes. And yep, George had another saw it coming because he did see it coming. So here's the real question, Dom. Is George, you know, has this commit memory. Will he do it for the viewers? <laughs> he he probably doesn't do it need for the to. content, the culture, <laughs> for the fans yeah. at home. I mean, he doesn't need to, but that, that's not yeah. the question here, Mason. Does he want to? And the answer to that's... that is hell yes. Yeah. If George wants a Twitch shout out, he's going to have to flashback this commit memory. If not, you're going to have to figure it out on your own. As we are seeing a bunch of mana tap, I think Elspeth Sun's champion. All right. George oh, wants to okay. win the tournament. Okay. Whatever. I mean, Reasonable. yeah, this is a probably a better use of six mana, but George. Buddy, yeah. come on. as we do see drew looks at the top card like Fine. No, not not gonna beat this unbeatable planeswalker we're going to game two there in a very fast game one for blue white control versus Rakdos mid-range you know sometimes we watch this matchup and the game one can last 20 30 minutes really easily not the case here we see why george has chosen to play this esper deck and the ramifications that has let's take a look at these players sideboards and see exactly what they might be going for in game number two here as we are starting off with drew Drew has three winning volleys, three duress, two extinction event, two go blank, two brotherhoods end, one necromantia, one abrade, and one colagon's command. Dom, if you were Drew, what might you be going for here? I think it's the cards you would expect against a control deck. Those duresses definitely coming in. Uh, the two go blanks, I think, as well. Uh, there isn't a ton in the way of graveyard synergies that you're breaking up, but just good old fashioned mind rot, I, I think, is perfectly acceptable as well. And then you can make a case for the colagon's command. You know, grind your game, you, you can finish off a paint walker, make your discard card, and buy back uh, a blood type harvester, something like that. Awesome, great, makes sense to me. Don't think there's me too much here. You know, Drew does have these invoke despairs, which, while very susceptible to counter spells, are heavy swing cards in these matchups. We're seeing Drew, you know, maybe not have as much as you would for other spots when it comes to grinding decks. George Javor, on the other hand, though, we have 80 cards for him. Let's see exactly what's going on over there. As we have two Thought Distortion, two Rest in Peace, two Temporary Lockdown, and then one of the rest of the way of Unmoored Ego, Mihook Massacre, Kaya, Orzhov Usurper, Farewell, Yorion, that's going to be our companion, a Cling to Dust, a Steinheim to Unleash, Boonbringer Valkyrie, and Lyra Dawnbringer. We, we've got some boom, booms in here. So I, the first question is, do you want the Angel Package, if you want to call it that, uh, the Lyra and the, the Boonbringer Valkyrie? Those cards are... Uh, they, they let you really put the opponent to the test where removal is concerned. However, in the face of four copies of Invoke Despair, once again, uh, uh, you know, that can get swept up for free along with a Bane's Walker and something else. So those are a little more risky here than they would be against a stock Ragdos deck. Uh, so the Sarnheim Unleashed, perfect in this matter. Uh, we could see uh, some of the other sideboard cards as well, but I think actually the sideboarding here is going to be pretty minimal from George in the end. Yeah, I have to agree. Also, Georgian you know, is someone who plays not only a lot of our events, but a lot of Pioneer, really is like a control sort of uh, expert and loves to play those sort of decks. So when George sees that Invoke Despair, he's going to realize, you know, like, okay, maybe my Boonbringer Valkyrie slash Lyra stuff isn't as impactful as it might normally be. Little does George know that, you know, his opponent has four of that card in his deck. So if he does choose to sort of pivot around that, he's going to be heavily rewarded. As we are going to come back to the table here in just a second, as the players should be finished with sideboarding, shuffling up in a second. 
as yet here they are and you know i kind of like the idea of george here going up to a yorion pile and getting some of these high impact black cards uh you know things like clean to dust are uh maybe not the thing you would immediately think of when you're splashing a color but you know sort of experimenting and checking like okay what can i actually do is something i think that's not done enough by players Yeah, Clinked Dust, notably excellent against uh, the Green Spine deck, which is one of the best decks in Pioneer. And also uh, things like the Rogue deck, which has been picking up a little bit of steam online. You remember in Standard, just having these uh, th these escape cards in your deck where you don't have to have to draw them even. They just get milled over by your opponent's cards, and then you can uh, turn that against them. Uh, really nice to have access to in that matchup as well. I would say my favorite part of Daughter's deck, though, and I'm not sure if this is part of the deck that was cut off on screen and like spilled over the, the melee page, is the, the split of one swamp and one snow-covered swamp. Uh, no no uh, actual <laughs> gameplay reason why you might need that, but just to, just to mix it up, just to keep the opponent uh, guessing. Yeah, I respect it, because you see, if I'm George, I'm going double swamp, and also, that's not because of anything in particular, I'm just afraid I won't write snow-covered swamp on my deck registration, I'll get a deck check and get a game loss for no reason. As we do see Urborg in the Thoughtseize here for <laughs> Drew, as George has five lands, Fatal Push, Supreme Verdict. I, I think one of those lands is, I want to say that's a normal swamp, but I could, could be wrong. It is a normal swamp. Now, see, here's the thing. So last time we mentioned, we, we called out George on his basic lands, and he was using draft block lands and all he plays is blue-white. He doesn't normally have black, so I'm not going to judge him on his swamp this time because that's not what he normally does. He's experimenting right now, and I want to encourage his growth. As we do see Supreme Verdict, be the take but i think that was a normal swamp as an esper triome sorry rafine's tower i'm a professional thank you thank you yes <laughs> so you see black blue cliffs into blood ties harvester and, and this is like a classic control hand and as chad is saying a classic george hand right it's just pretty reactive pretty slow but has the tools to uh, to keep up and maybe we're going on mm -hmm. as we do see another draw for turn here from drew and he has a thought season hand Looks like we're going to move to combat, get a Fatal Push, take down that Blood Tide Harvester, and will Drew have a follow-up threat? We saw this was sort of the problem in game uh, number one is, you know, Drew didn't get extra stuff down. As it does look like we have a black... Oh, it's a pathway. Okay. We have to see what color Drew wants there using the checklist cards. And looks like we went on the red side. As Graveyard Trespasser, another nice checklist that. card <laughs> coming down. I I, yeah, I, Fable as well, I have to imagine, going to be a new tech this hard too. So a lot of uh, DFCs are going on in this Rattus deck. 100%. Oh, you know what, Dom? You're right, that was a snow-covered swamp. Hey, GG's there, man. Good luck on the rest. As George passes the turn, three-man, nothing to do per usual for George. As a Gregor Trespasser, each side of the yeah, well, Excellent. Look, luckily, uh, Drew, uh, Drew has Urborg in play, so every land currently is is a swamp, uh, snow covered or otherwise. Uh, so, Dorsey is going to get countered by Sora coming. Uh, follow up, regular bank buster from Drew going along with a. Uh, and it looks like there should be day again because we did play two cells there. Um, but either way, Graveyard Trespass, a really nice, sticky thread. Uh, versatile across the board, especially good against control decks. Yep. We do see George play a Godless Shrine tap and is now thinking about what he wants to do. We don't know any of George's hand here, since we haven't seen the old thought sees again. As it does look like George is actually just going to pass the turn back to nighttime for Drew. We do see a swamp. That's a super swamp, like you mentioned, Urborg in play. MTGO players. Yeah, so, uh, it is land dash swamp swamp, I have to imagine, if you uh, <laughs> inspect the typeface character. <laughs> That's right. So we do see another Blood Tithe Harvester resolve. Get another blood crew up the bank buster, and we're gonna see George respond with an omen of the sea. Take a look, ski poo here. Probably looking for something like fatal push to answer the bank buster. Yeah, and that's an interesting decision point, right? Because if the bank buster sticks around, drawing a bunch of cards and then becomes a threat in its own right at the end, if you expose it to a fatal push here, you you lose one of that those sources of card advantage. But I think Drew senses weakness, wants to get the game over with, and sees this window to apply a lot of pressure. Yep. It looks like George playing temporary lockdown here. That's going to be a big one. It's going to get all these little things minus the graveyard trespasser underneath it. And George passes back. Funny enough, it hits George's own omen of the sea. So if George yes. later in the game flickers it with Yorion, he might get more, but he'll also get a little draw off it. So, you know, that's a little bit of deck building going on for George Shabor here as we do see the graveyard trespasser bashing for four. And 
George is at, I think, four life here. Some would say if you just had left the Omen in play, you could flick it out with the Orion as well. And that's true, but that's not the point, Mason, is it? Uh, so, no, that's not the point. <laughs> uh, so George does have to ferry Hero Dominaria, uh, attempting to save lives here. Going to have to have the Trespasser, lose his other remaining card in the process. And notably, when George had the temporary lockdown, Drew lost those two blood tokens, didn't use those so to cash in for a new card. So maybe suggesting, assuming remembered about that option, that that one card left in hand is, is a banger, something he wants to keep. I was say, I think Drew just maybe picked up a shield of the apocalypse. It's also definitely just one turn away okay. from the graveyard trespasser again. Well, Shielded is a banger. That one certainly qualifies. Yeah. yeah. You know, Teferi's Plus doesn't look very good when you're at four life against Shieldred, as it does look like Shieldred's coming down. George Also, Invoke draws... Despair, threatening to just end this game at any point. Yeah, that, that's a great point, actually. George here, you know, knows that card's in the opponent's deck. Uh, George goes for the tick up. The stack isn't empty. <laughs> George is pausing. Uh-oh! Uh-oh! George, oh no, he had a shock land, so he couldn't cast his farewell. He's going to move on to game number three here, and that is the power of Shielder of the Apocalypse. Getting that immediate two damage really mattered. There. You know, a card like Kalidus or Sword of the Merciless card we've seen players maybe try in the past aren't going to do that there. Shielder's going to immediately get that too as we see this player shuffling up for game three. Wow, what an ending to that game. I and and Drew was on top of it as well. You know, he 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 jabbed his finger on that shielded right away. He, he wasn't going to let George uh, uh, get that extra card. So uh, we will be going to game three here. We we saw in in that game two why uh, I think the Ragnar deck starts ahead against these control decks, and then you have to pull back that edge in deck building and in the games uh, as well. But uh, George on the play with his configuration in game three, uh, probably liking his chances, I imagine. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, Pioneer, a lot of play draw matters a lot. And especially in this matchup, you know, we saw how the Blood Tithe Harvester has gone down in all these games. And then it provides some pressure and forced George to answer. If George can counter that early or maybe counter a Bank Buster from Drew, that's going to really allow George the space to resolve his game ending cards like Elspeth Sun Champion, like Teferi Hero Dominaria. And then, you know, when Drew tries to stick those uh, later game cards, Hey, George is ready to fight one for one battles. That's what he does. Speaking of battles, Dom, I wanted to give a shout out to some of our future events coming up here because, you know, we are battling here in St. Paul this weekend, but maybe you're enjoying when to play the future one. So we have a couple other events this year that we've announced. Our next event is going to be in Chicagoland. Uh, it's going to be uh, a modern and legacy event. So if you're a legacy fan, this is the event you want to get after. That's going to be June 24th and the 25th, just over a month from this weekend. That's really exciting. That Modern King K Showdown will be the winner. It's going to go to our Players Championship at the end of the year. Let's check out the other events coming up this year because we did announce them over the past week. That's right. We're going to St. Louis again, July 8th and 9th. We're going to have a Team Showdown 10K and a Legacy Trial 5K. Um, I I'll make sure the booth will tell me if I'm wrong here, but I believe it is Pioneer Modern Legacy for our Team Showdown. So, hey, if you're a Legacy fan, we really love you here on the Energy Series, and we want to see you at our events. We have a lot of legacy events this year. As we're going back to our feature match area with George Jabor here, who I believe, Dom, this is a kind of a hot take. I'm not so sure. He probably plays back to basics and legacy. I think George Jabor is a blue white. Uh, that, would... <laughs> <laughs> that, that would not surprise me. I'm sure he has some some well loved uh, tundras and whatever his legacy deck of choice is uh, at the moment. We also do have a show coming up in uh, Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in. in... I, I believe it's August, and that, that one's my neck of the woods. I might try and make my way uh, out for that one. But in the meantime, here we're going to see uh, Drew going down to six uh, for this deciding game three. There we go. We had the side already there for you. 10K Modern Showdown on the Saturday and a 5K Pioneer Trial there on the Sunday, August the 12th and the 13th there. Uh, so mark your calendars for that one as well. And it, it's interesting looking at the the builds of each of these two decks. If you told George he's going to play against Rados in the tournament, which that one's a safe bet. You don't need to tell him that. <laughs> then maybe this is how he wants to build his deck with that in mind. If you told Drew you're going to be facing a control deck with five different unique planeswalkers, well, having four invoked to in your deck is a good hedge against that too. So we're kind of seeing both of these decks optimized for this specific matchup, even if it's maybe more predictable from one side than the other. Yeah, and we are seeing Drew here going down to five. And yeah, like you mentioned, both these decks are sort of decks you would kind of expect to play against, right? Like, you know you're going to play against Rakdos. You know there's a large uh, subset of players that love Blue, White, and Pioneer. And honestly, Blue, White does pretty good in the Pioneer online challenges. So clearly there's some strength to that deck, despite what players say. 
but you wouldn't even not expect these exact configurations. And that's one of the coolest parts of magic, right? Is you can take these ideas and these decks and sort of innovate and grow on them and take different approaches while still having the core same idea. Yeah, and often when we talk about innovation in magic, often it isn't uh, building an entirely new deck that you've never seen before. It's often taking an existing shell that is well known and changing five cards here, 10 cards there, and then ending up with something which is the same archetype. You call it the same name when you, you register on Melee, but uh, it has some crucial differences in how the games play out. And you see the <laughs> frowning face from Drew there going down to five. Can't be feeling great about how, how things are going so far. Yeah. I, also, I don't know if you noticed, Drew normally has a smiley face on seven, had the straight line on six. Like, eh, it happens. I can only imagine <laughs> if there's a little teardrop if we go to four, you know, with one of the cards in the eyes. But we'll have to see what Drew's... Uh, Drew is going to keep five cards here. Looks like Drew's taking a big think on it. But by the time you get down to three cards, you just don't have enough rectangles to make a face anymore. So yeah, uh, <laughs> you're spared whatever emotion that would be. Is there, is he a draft kind of coming past through the turn? Yeah, that's despair. As we are going to see Blood Crypt pass back. Another Drown Catacomb and passing the turn. You know, this is one of the things about George's deck is he has a lot of these check lands. And against a deck like Mono White, which has fallen out of favor, George would be in trouble. But, you know, George knows that deck's not as popular in the metagame. He can afford to take these risks because we do see Reckoner Bankbuster coming down into George's own version of Reckoner Bankbuster, Omen of the Sea, coming down for a little Scry 2, draw 1. <laughs> and Bank Bankbuster is a card that can let you repay your draw after a Mulligan Five. So uh, that, that's something that Drew has going for him, at least. And yeah, with with the Black Splash in Georgia's deck, there's a bit of give and a bit of take, right? Because uh, on the one hand, you gain access to these really good, cheap tools like Fatal Push, like Horses. But to play those, you have to splash an entire third color, and that comes with some big sacrifices in your mana base, and we're kind of seeing some of those there. Yeah, also, I think George just drew the land for turn. We saw him main face that Omen of the Sea and just play the card he drew. He drew the uh, Hollow Fountain here, shocked it in. So George Jabor, four mana, is doing his thing. As Drew here is playing a pathway again. Looks like we're in the black side this time. That makes sense with Invoke Despair. You know, no Ouroboros going on as we're going to see Blood Tithe Harvester come on down. And looks like George is taking a big think on if he wants to fight over this or not. As we are going to see a Shieldred's Edict in response. Okay. Curious what mode George is choosing on that. I imagine it's the creature mode, but... Looks like yeah. it is. So the first Harvester bites the dust. Second Harvester is in. And are we going to try and get frisky with this Bank Buster? Or are we just sitting back and drawing some cards there? Yeah, it's an interesting spot, too, because you saw George do this. You also saw George shock in the land, right? So you know he has some other play, and we are going to see the second shield of there take down the Blood Tithe Harvester. Drew here on the Mulligan to five is going to try and recoup some resources, Reckoner Bank Buster. As we do see Godless Run coming in. Shot and down to 12. So is this, is it fairy time? Yeah, it it's the fairy time. As we are going to see a tick up and then some untapping of some lands. Do you think George will untap Drew's lands as a homie? No. Well, it looks like we're going to tap I, I don't and use think it so, Although, yeah, so you, using a neat little trick here, you can use the mana to foretell at any time on your turn. And so in your own end step, uh, George uh, can put that one there. And there are a few different foretell cards you can play in Blue Eye Control, but I think Drew saw it, saw, saw it coming in games one and two. So has a pretty good idea of what that's going to be. This. This is a big turn, though. If he has fifth-hand invoke to spare, uh, just like in standard, then I think to really swing in his favor. But it looks like we just have Graveyard Trespasser. Okay. Yep. And, oh, it looks like, yeah, Drew's going to go for his own Blood Tide Harvester, get that ping on George. And now Drew's got to make a choice. Makes are sense. we going to try and fight down the Teferi, or are we going to just bash George in the face? And we are going to get the Teferi down to one, so it's more manageable loyalty. Yeah, Teferi down to one, but it's going to go back up to two. And when the opponent gets to untap uh, with Teferi, then uh, you can't feel good about things. And also, uh, we did see uh, among George's 95 cards hanging out in the sideboard, there is the one Stunheim on leash. Uh, so that could, that could be that card that's just uh, chilling in the Fortel zone right now. It definitely could be. As, yeah, it does look like George is main feigning the Wandering Emperor and is going after the Graveyard Trespasser. Is going to pay the ward cost, discard a Godless Shrine, as we are going to see Drew pop a blood in response, discard a pathway. And yeah, that's going to get exiled, and George is going to go back to 13. So George has got the battlefield back under control a little bit. Plays his Rafine's Tower, doesn't want to cycle it. 
And that's probably a really scary sign if you're Drew. George is like, I want my sixth land for sure. <laughs> oh, I, I'm also working up. towards the point where George might be able to just pick up and cast Yo Yo on in the same turn and really get a, a crushing advantage that way. Holy George is <laughs> both Lyra Dawnbringer and Shark Typhoon. Looks like George is going in, and Drew's going to have to take a big think here for a second because those cards are both very real. Yeah, and Drew just doesn't have Mason, the pressure. Mm -hmm. If you have uh, your one Sunham in leash and you have your one Lyra Dawnbringer, well, that, that's a, a Splinter Twin situation right there, my friend. That is a Splinter Twin. There's no beating that as Drew drew a card. Doesn't look to be another Thoughtseize, but we are going to activate Reckoner Bankbuster. If we find Thoughtseize here, Drew could start to stabilize a little bit. Looks like we found Castle Lockpoint into Blood Tithe Harvester as George is going to cast Salt coming on the Blood Tithe Harvester. And make, just make sure the board's empty, just in case Lyra can't stabilize on her own. You know, we don't want to put too much pressure on her. She, you know, she's a big girl and could do it, but you know, we don't want to have to force her to. But Lyra plays by her own rules. True. And you know what? I respect it as Lyra comes down here. I respect George's dedication to the blue white life where he could leave up the triome, which it doesn't matter. The, you know, the, uh, the Tapiris can do it anyways, but we're going to make sure that Hallowed Fountain's up. Respect for where we came from, you know, <laughs> as we <laughs> untap for turn here. And that Lyra's big. 6-6, six, six, first strike, lifelink. Yeah, I mean, it didn't need to be any bigger, but Wandering Emperor just lending a helping hand regardless. Yeah, oh, and Drew here, Cast Arrest. Looks like he maybe picked up a card like Shieldred. Oh, he's going to activate his castle once to get his cards out of hand first. Yeah, and got a farewell from George from the duress, though. So now George won't be able to wipe the board. Unfortunate for George. He'll just have to live with his Lyra. Yeah. But well, synergizes so nicely with this uh, heavy main to focus here from George. A card you see as a one of or a two of in a, a lot of these blue eye control decks, but especially nice in this setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as we are going to see, we're going to make just a, a samurai here. And I really like this play from George. You know, game one, he saw the invokes. He doesn't know about the four invokes like we do, but it's a way to play on the card he saw. As we do see a pick up of Yorion and just a hard casting of it. That's going to flicker the Emperor, and we're going to make another Samurai, and we're going to draw, oh, sorry, Scratch, you draw one off the Omen. Yeah, one of those neat synergies in uh, these control decks is you flicker your Wandering Emperor, it comes back, but because it's still your own turn, you can activate it in your own end step. It is a turn, technically, the Emperor came back into play, uh, so you get another Samurai or another Exile effect uh, immediately. Yeah, and we're going to see Drew activate Reckoner Bankless here. That's going to give him a Treasure and a Pilot. We're going to see another Duress. Dovin's Veto, George is like, no, not only do you not get to see my hand, I maybe have something that you wanted. And Drew, it's got the fourth land and does have Shield of the Apocalypse. Okay. You know, Drew's under the gun for sure right now, but at least we have a card that can start stabilizing a little bit. Yeah, and George is going to uh, lose two and then gain, gain six, maybe gain some more, add to my, my Wandering Emperor. There's a lot going on here. Yeah, as we do see, you know, the Yorion, Lyra, and the two Samurais swing in, and Drew is defeated. George Shabor wins round number one here. Exciting first match we had there, you know. A lot going on from these two exciting different builds of the deck. We are going to have George Shabor on for interview in a second, so if you're a Control fan or a George fan, just wait around a couple seconds here. We're going to have that, and we also have a backup match that we're going to try and get to if we have time looking around, and, you know, when we sort of pick this feature match, Dom, jokingly like oh we probably won't have time it's Rakdos versus blue white but those are some really quick games there and sort of shows how different when you your games can be when you're sort of threat dense in the way that george is compared to normal blue white control lists which are kind of threat light yeah just a nice little esper aggro deck uh taking the opponent to the cleanest number. and those of you who predicted with your channel points that george was going to win the match uh, handsomely rewarded you never lost faith and nor should you have done uh your boy took it down and we will hear from george uh, in just a second here and he seems to be thriving right now he's in his lane uh just carving through uh the most popular deck in the field uh you gotta be loving life right now yeah i mean if you're george right like if you're make you're playing this deck there's probably some exact reasons and i'm gonna assume one of them is rakdos like you must think your rakdos matchup is better you're not going to go into a field unless you think your rakdos and green matchup one of them has to be good right maybe you can take some risk and like that's eh, a little dicey post board i got some cards for them 
but you're going to have to beat those decks if you're going to succeed in Pioneer and Georgia that he plays a bunch of our events. And we have eight rounds today. So getting a Rakdos win early on has got to have you feeling pretty good about like, okay, this is what I came to do, sort of did it round one. Let's just keep that up for the rest of the day. Yeah, going to be a long day, eight rounds of Swiss there. And with a control deck like that, you often don't get that many free wins. You kind of have to work for them. You're not kidding the opponent on turn four or uh, picking up free wins that way. But George, uh, th this is a life he chose. This is a life he loves and uh, living it pretty well so far, so. That's true. Also, I think this might be a gross moment. I don't think George has days in doing his deck. I'm taking a little look skipoo at his deck list here. Oh. I just realized no days in doing. So we're gonna have to congratulate George for moving on past days of doing. He's committed to commit memory. You know, doesn't well, have a fear of commitment. I, 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 I was. I was going to say, we're not moving away from that angle altogether. We can still do the, the Nasa time twister thing, uh, but just just a little bit of a different approach to it. Yep. And George is ready. So around, let's go and I talk am, to him. I am surprised that we have 80 cards. Yeah. <laughs> let's ask him that directly once we have him uh, in the booth there. Yeah, it looks like he, I heard he was ready, but we've got some stuff going on in a second here. It might just be a situation. You know, George plays blue-white control. You know, he doesn't uh, oh, normally do this sort of thing. Hey, George, congratulations on the one win. How you doing? Me and Dom are doing well. So first we wanted to say, good job on the basics. We want to get that out of the way. <laughs> You're welcome. And number two, congratulations on moving past days I'm doing. We saw you decide to play Commit Memory instead. What, what's sort of going on there? Because Dom and I are very interested. You know, you have 80 cards, but no room for days I'm doing. What's happening? Oh, well, there's there's plenty of room. And that spot is still there. And that spot is still right here in my heart. But I think as I'm sitting there and, and planning out these 80 cards, I really just want more interaction. The One of the decks that's on my mind a lot this past week or two was Grease Fang. And Days Undoing's okay there if you have the Narset. And I felt like nothing in the meta right now calls for me to try to combo as fast as possible. And obviously, I'm on Yorian, 80 cards, so it's less uh, likely for me to combo that often. So. I thought, well, if I'm not trying to combo with Days Undoing and Narset, I might as well upgrade that slot into something that I can interact with on the front half. And then later on, if the game calls for it, like if it's a really long mono green game, I can then go back in and seal the deal. Awesome. Great. So, so Green now, was one of the decks. We got a, I, I was going to say, before we get to the more serious questions, we got to know about <laughs> the one swamp, the one snow covered swamp. <laughs> What's the deal yeah. that? What's going on? Okay. That's really risky. You're going to get a deck right here if you keep that up, George. I'm just letting you know. I, yeah. I checked that so many times over the last 10 hours. Uh, so what happened was, if you don't, if you recall, Mason, last time I was on coverage, I had white border, you know, revised basics. And after the fact, I upgraded to, to beta planes and beta islands. And mm -hmm. sometime around two weeks ago, I switched to Esper. And I hadn't purchased beta swamps yet. So I looked through my binder, looked through my pile of cards. I had a black border foreign swamp or in fourth edition and a snow covered swamp <laughs> so <laughs> rather than do a mismatched white border i thought maybe nobody would notice yet here we are <laughs> uh, well we, we love some uh you can't get anything past us, George. <laughs> yeah. i know clearly yeah you're going to go back watch your feature match there are definitely some comments on the basic land but we're going to leave that for you the viewers already of course heard those but on to, you know, a, a serious question. So it sounds like Grease Fang is a deck you were targeting. Was that the thing that moved you from blue-white? Because, you know, we've seen you on the tour here and on Twitch. You love blue-white control, but now you're on Esper. What caused this change? Yeah, I mean, blue-white's main removal spell right now is lay down arms. And they'll play a couple of marches and a couple of maybe one fateful absence here or there. But the majority of the removal, you know, Supreme Verdict just does not deal with game the, the plan A of Grease Fang, which is a very popular, very strong deck. And I thought, you know, in the past, Esper's been kind of a difficult uh, ask with the mana base. And, you know, I threw it into some mana base calculators and I wasn't unhappy with the numbers. And I thought, hey, you know, no risk, no reward. I think if I want to play against certain decks and beat them, I'm going to have to risk something to gain something else out of it. And it was a calculated risk. And I, I think I'm still pretty confident with, you know, having the main deck pushes and having some lands that trigger revolt. I have the sharks. I have the omen of the seas. And so... Hopefully I get more game against that. And uh, Fatal Push also gives me a huge game against Creature Lands, which is a big way Blue White loses the game when it goes late. I think it's in a pretty good spot right now, Esper. That's awesome. I guess my biggest question I think that when everyone's asking about is Kaya the Slayer uh, from Ma, from All Be One. What is the Kaya for specifically in matchups? Is that just a card for like other go big decks? What, what is exactly the goal of Kaya there? 
that's because I hate Rakdos. <laughs> sure. I, th I needed another Elspeth kind of effect, some big, flashy Planeswalker that can take over the game late. When you top deck it, it just slams, and you just win the game, essentially. And I didn't want to play a second Elspeth because it's obviously legendary, and um, you know, if I have a second one, it's not really going to go go far. But um, uh, you know, I looked through Scryfall a hundred different ways to find something that could fit that fit that bill. And Soren Grim Nemesis was also on the short list. But in the end, I went with Kaya. I mean, being able to exile uh, a creature is huge instead of destroy it. Being able to draw two and kind of a board stall uh, can also go really far. And uh, it's been okay in testing. Obviously, it's not like it's not Teferi, it's not the Wandering Emperor, it's not this high-powered card, but being able to have access to something in the late game that you could top deck to kind of turn the tide, I think is is pretty good. But it's kind of a flex slot. No, it makes total sense. Elspeth Sun Champion is unkillable, so why would you ever play a second one? <laughs> exactly. Of course, awesome. Well, George, are you excited for the rest of this weekend? Seven more rounds to go. Pioneer action. Are you loving the format? I, I am enjoying the format. Sorry to all the Pioneer haters. It's a great format if you find your niche. If you uh you know take your foot off the pedal and just zoom back out and, and, and enjoy it for what it is, I'm looking forward to the rest of the weekend. Awesome, great. Dom, any questions for George before we let him go here? I'm sure we'll see him back in the future of if he keeps up like he was doing this past round. I, I'm curious uh, mostly about the the Lyra Dawnbringer Boombringer Valkyrie set in the sideboard too. Let's get into that one real quick. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh so Lyra is kind of the Bane Slayer of my choice right now in that it can also buff the um, Starnheim Unleashed Angels. So the idea is you just want something to gum up the board against decks like Rakdos, even against decks like Griefsfang. A lot of people are on the cat plan right now, which I think is a great plan, you know, with Regal Caracal and Brumas King Arescus. But I think having access to the Angels uh, to be able to block the Griefsfang tokens is huge instead of just being on the ground. And Boombringer Valkyrie is the actual Bane Bane Slayer Angel replacement because for all intents and purposes, it's the same text, except for the fact like if you've got uh, a soldier token or a samurai token or a shark token, it could buff it for that turn and give give you like a three, four, five point life swing. And even just there without attacking itself, stabilize the board. So I think it's pretty strong and um, I don't see a problem with going with the cat plan if you've got a, uh, your own reasons to in your metagame. That makes a lot of sense here. I'm sensing a lot of respect from uh, for the Grease Fang deck from you here, yeah. George. Absolutely, you know, yeah. It, yeah. It's funny, though, that the cat plan doesn't line up very well against the rat, but we're going to have to get that one over to our friends in R&D and have them figure out why exactly that is. Maybe they can get us a new cat in the next year or so. If we can get some flying cats, I'd love that, yes. Perfect. You heard it here first, Watsy. Make sure to do that. But, George, thank you so much for taking some time to talk to us. Go enjoy the rest of your time between the round. We'll see you later. And I think we're going to try and get a backup feature match here uh, for our players. I don't know if we have the time. I'm going to let coverage sort of tell me in the background and let us know. We're going into it right now. It's a pretty exciting matchup, too. We have uh, some decks we don't actually see that much in Pioneer, Dom. We have Mono Red Burn uh, from here from Steven. And then we have Mono, I'm sorry, from Brad. And we have Steven on Mono Red Fires. Yeah, so uh, a Mono Red Mirror of Swords, but not quite with all, the, all of that implies. So we have. A pretty classic pioneer strategy on the left here in uh, Mono Red Burn. Got a few recent upgrades like the Kamano Faces Kakazan that you see there uh, on turn one for Brad, one, one of your better stars. And then uh, Mono Red Fires on the right uh, from, from Arsene. So this is a uh, Fires of Invention deck, but usually those sp spill over into four colors, five colors. This is just Mono Red. And then I guess a, there's like a little Eldrazi component. So it's like one and a half colors, but then Devoid isn't a color. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how the math works out there. Yeah, I'm not a mathematician. I'm going to leave that to Frank Carson. He can tell us in the Twitch chat. Uh, but we are going to see Grim Lava Mancer and just a main phase play with the fire and a scry here for Brad as Steven is going to play Fable of the Mirror Breaker onto the board. And, uh, so really quick here, uh, just this is a time shift to match. So it's a recording for everyone at home. Uh, Austin is actually the name, the first name of the player on the right here. We accidentally jumbled it up a bit. We're going to blame uh, Austin's parents for giving him two first names. Uh, but for now, that's on us, and we're <laughs> sorry for that here. Uh, as we are going to see Fable Resolve, and Brad's going to flip his Kamano Faces tokens on over in uh, to the Kamano side, the 2-2 Haster, and see what he can do. Also, I'm just noticing this, Dom. It's not only a pseudo mirror. We have the same sleeves, too. So they're really, they got the same vibes going oh, on. Oh, 
yeah, let, let's hope there are no cards that let them, you know, exchange permanence or use cards oh. from each other's deck. Uh, no ragged rounds in this format, at least. So don't have to worry about resolving all of that when this is said and done. But uh, yeah, the whole uh, double first name thing. As uh, Clark Mason, I'm, I'm sure you are uh, well aware of how tra uh, traumatic that can be. It, it can be, and I stand in solidarity, you know, and I, Austin understands what I understand, you know, and this happens sometimes. Uh, as we are going to see an attack here, we're going to see the Goblin Shaman get in the way of uh, the Kamana there. And you're going to take four here from two and down to 12. And this is the big turn. You know, this is a Fires of Invention red deck. So if we have the, la the untapped land and the Fires, we're going to get to do it here. But first, we are going to resolve our Fable, the Mirror Breaker, get some rummaging going on. I'm really glad Fable is seeing play in our future match here. here. Now, I think it's a card that players don't get to see enough of. <laughs> and it's just like such a cool card. So, funnily enough, I know people are kind of sick of it in standard, and maybe after this time, two weeks from now, we'll not have to worry about that anymore over there. But I think in Pioneer, it actually is a pretty neat card. You see it going in just these uh, mid range decks, but also some of these combo decks like Creativity and so on, and then the various fire decks, whether it's this fire deck or the Transmogrify fire deck, Enigmatic Incarnation. It just kind of ties you together in a really neat way. So, it is a very popular card, but given that, it's one that I'm, I'm pretty happy with being a popular card, if that makes sense. No, it makes total sense, and I have to agree. We, by the way, we're going to see the Mirix into Fires dimension here from Austin. Then Austin's going to play Karn the Great Creator, and it looks like we are going to be minusing, maybe. Oh, looks like he's actually... Okay, we'll just pick on five and go to three. We're going to minus. We'll see yeah. what he gets in a second. But yeah, I agree. I actually think Fable the Mirror Breaker is one of the more fun, powerful cards we've had. A lot of its points are into smoothing, right? Like, it's really good just making sure your game plan happens. And my hot take is playing Magic is fun. As Shadow Sphere goes to the hand of Austin, wonder why he wants the lifelink against the Burn deck. Maybe I have to talk to him later about that one. Yeah, fires into Khan, really nice turn four in the abstract, but it doesn't affect the board immediately. And so a window here for Brad on the burn deck to, uh, we'll see if he can close the deal this turn. Uh, it's tall order, but we'll see if he can get it done. Yeah, we're going to see a stomp face, skewer face, oh, sorry, a skewer on the Karn there, uh, due to Spectacle. And that's going to trigger our Swiss Spears twice and then attack for five. Austin's going to be... Uh, sorry, attack for six because we have uh, the two instant or sorceries for Grim Lava Mancer there, or Lava Runner, my B, down to four. Yeah, so uh, Austin down to four, and if so, Skewer could have gone upstairs, put him down to one, but one is not zero, and so Brad deciding that just getting the card off the board uh, is, is a safer option given all of that. You know, if Steven has another Cavalier in hand, he could win this turn because he could Cavalier give haste, copy, play another creature, attack, and buff the team. I don't think he has the second Cavalier. Looks like he has a Glorybringer and a Shadow Spear. Dom, does this work the way I think it does? It, it does, Mason. This is a little combination right here. So Glory oh. Banger going to come into the red zone. Going to shoot something for four, gain four life, and then deal five damage, gain five more life. Steven now at a, a comfortable 10. We're back in double digits here, folks. Yeah, I mean, whew, holy. Wait, is it more, though? Because I thought Glorybringer does the damage. You gain four, and then you gain five, right? So Steven yeah, should be like exactly. 14. Yeah. Holy. Yeah, that's a Splinter Twin situation. Chat's right. We're going to give it to that one. As we are going to see the Kamano flip over here again. And wow, that is a swing from... Oh, you can see it on Austin's face too. He's like, whew. All right, I was in a little bit of trouble. I'm not out of it yet. But now at least things are looking nice. Yeah, Shadow Spear uh, being equipped back onto favor of the Mirror Bay too. Just letting that one uh, play defense pretty nicely. Yeah, and... Looks like we are going to see an attack with all the creatures that can. Fail the Mirror Breaker is going to block the 2-2. Two, two. It's going to end up uh, being a net two lessons loss for Steven here. I'm sorry, Austin. And looks like there's no follow-ups play here from Brad. As you know, we're going to put our sleep back on the floor. Bring a little way to notify Exert uh, if you didn't play during the day. Yeah, they, they had those little uh, cutout markers from those sheets that would come in the packs, but I don't think I've ever actually seen huh. those used in the wild. People usually just find someone better way to do this. Oh, oh God, it's dragon time, Mason. Yeah, I hope you like dragons, Brad, because here they come and they're exerting. Steven doesn't even make a copy. We could have had four Glorybringers on screen, but instead we're just going to uh, have to deal for losing half your board, gaining another nine life, <laughs> putting in more power and putting the Shadow Spear back on the fable of the Mirror Breaker here. <laughs> As wow, Austin has just really stabilized and asked the world, Do you like dragons? I, I'm so happy you. we got to see this this morning. This is yeah. worth waking up for. <laughs> it really was. Also, you know, 
this has been really great here. And there's been some really cool additions here to Austin's deck, right? Like the Mirax is a cool little land that, you know, when fire mentions, you're looking for some amount of utility lands, ways to use your mana. That's a great way to sort of, you know, against longer decks, maybe grind. And that's a cool little innovation you're to see from Austin's deck. We're going to see if we can get more of this match for you here. We still have a couple minutes left in this round uh, happening. I think we're just pulling up game number two here. But yeah, honestly, I did not expect Austin to get out of that. You know, he was so far behind and just showed the swing power of Fire's Invention. And swing power of Glorybringer, too. That one can really turn the tables uh, quickly. And you saw that cheeky little grin there at the end from Brad. Like, he, even despite being on the receiving end of that, uh, that, that sudden pummeling, like, he, he could appreciate it. You know, he, he's, uh, he's having a good time. Yeah, you know, Brad knew what he signed up for, right? He was like, listen, my deck can't be Glorybringer Shadow Screen. If someone brings it, I lose. And then round one, sometimes beats happen, you know? <laughs> As we do see Den the Bugbear into a play with fire immediately here. Uh, Brad's going to take a little scry action. Looks like there's a mountain on top. And Brad's going to keep it. Maybe he's got some two drops he wants to play. Maybe a little double spell action. As Brad is going to play Vishino Pyromancer. Bang. Two more. Steven down to 16. Yeah, tell him play with fire. Never the ideal start, unless it's shooting down a Lanawa Elves or something like that. You really want to be getting on the board quickly, one drop into two drop, and this isn't a terrible start from Brad, but it's not ideal. And so, I've got to have a good follow up here. Wizards Lightning. Okay, so dealing more and more damage down to thirteen already. Oh, and, and here's light up the stage. stage. Looks like the two cards are off screen, so it's gonna be a surprise to everyone. Looks like one of them was play with fire. Bang. Austin. Dead. Yeah, those cards. <laughs> This card did exit stage left there, so I can't quite see what's going on. But uh, we, we can we can figure it out. Stage left, you say? <laughs> what a great choice of words! As we're going to see a stomp here on the machine of Pyromancer, because you know Stephen does have Sweltering Suns in hand, doesn't have the mana to cast it, and there just aren't many creatures this game. You know, last game we saw Brad flood the board. This game it's been all spells. As it looks like the last card was their own Bone Crusher Giant, a stomp on Stephen's face, and attack for two, down to seven. As we're going to see a cycling of the Sweltering Suns, trying to find our big power cards. Glitterbringer was one of the two draws for turn. Yeah, interesting that uh, instead of just playing the Bone Crusher, yeah, we opted for the cycling. Yeah, but we did find the fourth land. Uh, we have fires, and we have Ordnots here as well. A card that we haven't seen in a hot minute here, but that one's going to take out the removal spell from Brad's hand, leave him with just uh, a second den of the Bugbear left over, and a uh, to stabilize this board here. Yeah, you know, Brad got a lot of damage in early and has Steven very low. But, you know, like we just said, the Thought Knot's here stabilizing the board, took the kill spell for the Thought Knot. And now Steven, you know, yeah, he has the fifth land. Does he have, he has Glorybringer for sure? Does he have anything else that he can cast? We know there's at least a Bone Crusher Giant on Adventure. And it looks like there's a Karn in hand. So <laughs> Steven could get, you know, Karn into Shadow Spear, attack for five, and offer the trade that would, you know, Give Brad the draw. Looks like we're just going to do Glorybringer plus Bone Crusher Giant. And then we're going to see, are we exerting or not? Looks like we are. We're going to take down the Bone Crusher Giant from Brad as Brad goes down to 16. Yeah, really nice there. Uh, nice turn there from, uh, uh, from Arson. Yeah. Oh, we are going to see a Kamado Face. Kamado so Face is a little late. Yeah. And then Grim Lava Runner coming down. Yeah, and Austin's down to six here from the ping. But we do have Karn plus Shadow Spear again. So as long as we didn't accidentally shuffle that into our deck, we should be able to play it equipped to the Bone Crusher and just gain five and then move it over to the Thought Knot Seer or whichever way you think is best. And, and even if the Shadow Spear did uh, wander off and get lost somewhere, we, we got some bangs in the sideboard there we can find as well. But it is just going to be the Shadow Spear, uh, the go-to card for good reason against any kind of uh, aggressive red deck. Yep, as we are going to see an attack here for five and a move back over to the Bone Crusher Giant. I like this sort of maneuvering of it. You know, this way, if your opponent has to kill your blocker, they don't get to draw a card and they'll lose some life in the exchange. So, pretty great here. As we do see a monetary Swiss Spear gets a counter from Commander Faces Second Bond. If you think zone. about what happened with uh, Fazim Invention in this game, we, we paid four mana for it, but then we immediately got all of the that back by casting a free thought not say and then on the following turn we played free glory bringer right free card <laughs> that got the shadow spear which we could just cast for free and then that left us mana Whoa! to equip it and then re-equip it again so oh god it's combustible gear <laughs> combustible gear is entering the let's go 
So uh, the way this works is Aust uh, Steven's going to reveal some cards on the top of the deck. Uh, Brad's either going to lose that life or Steven's going to draw cards. Sorry, you have to choose beforehand, and Steven got to draw the cards. As we do find a Cavalier Flames. It's Cavalier. Oh, God. <laughs> Everyone gains haste, and we're attacking with all okay, of these creatures. And an Quick pass, <laughs> Mason. How much damage is this? Uh, 6, 12, 16, 25 damage coming in at Brad, and Brad's going to take a little handshake there. Congratulations to Steven there winning that round. Very exciting sort of deck there. And we saw just like you mentioned how strong fire dimension was, right? We spent four mana, we stabilized towards it, and then we got like 30 mana out of it over two turns, not even counting the fact that we got to you know play our Shadow Spirit and equip and move that around. So very exciting deck there from Steven. Maybe we'll have to see it in the later rounds if he keeps up with winning. You know, our last event thought we had a player playing a deck like this lose out and win in for top eight. So it definitely is a deck that can succeed. Speaking of Succeed, Dom, we're going to have more magic for everyone here. So they're going to have a lot of fun this weekend. So they're going to make sure to follow the channel. But we are going to take a quick break before our round number two. So go use the bathroom, get some water, and we'll be back in just a couple minutes with some more Magic Gathering here from St. Paul. <laughs> 